Thank you, Paul. Good evening. Thank you very much. It's always daunting to be doing anything with your father at all. And uh, it's also an honor to be with him tonight. And I really want to thank Paul Signorelli for putting this together. Um, as he said, we're going to be talking a little bit about the Vietnam War tonight. And, and before we get started, I just wanted to, to say that I, I feel rather indulgent in talking about the Vietnam War, something that happened quite some times ago when we actually have a situation in Rwanda, in Bosnia, that we need to pay attention to, that we're not paying attention to enough in this country. And so I do feel rather indulgent and I appreciate your being here tonight and to look at the Vietnam War through the perspective of, of uh, myself and of my father. <coughs> um, it, let me quickly mention that where the ashes are um, came partly because no one had talked about the kind of experience that my father went through. He speaks English, but he prefers to write and speak in Vietnamese. Uh, he wrote his memoir about 12 years in prison uh, in Vietnamese. I started translating it, and then I decided that, well, my uncle decided that it was a bad translation. So I said, well, I'll just go and write my own book. Um, but it is the story of my father's uh, capture in 1968 in Hue, in the Tet Offensive that, that many of us will remember. And it's also about what happened to the rest of the family during that time of the war of 1968 to 1975, when I left Vietnam um, in, in 1975. And also about life in America for me and, and what it means for me. Do I call this country home? Does he call this country home? Um, and we differ on that at times. And, and the conflict that my father and I have gone through over the years on this issue of home is partly described in, in where the ashes are. Um, one of the things that I've been mentioning to people that have been curious, if you look at him, if you look at my father now, you wouldn't realize that he spent 12 years in prison. Um, and it was difficult for him. He can tell you in, in, later on if you want to ask questions about that time. I keep saying that he wasn't tortured, but I keep reminding myself that to live in a room where you pace back and forth two steps one way and two steps the other. And when you lean your back against one wall, your knees touch the walls in front of you. I would call that torture as well. He doesn't talk about it very much. Um, so I write about that, and it's difficult for me to write about my father and to realize what he's gone through, to read his, his um, memoir. And one of the things that I always wonder is what I would do in that kind of situation how I would survive, and how he came out with such sanity. And one of the things that my father did, that he described a lot in his own book, um, was to write poetry. In prison, he, he didn't have paper, he didn't have permission. And so he would compose poetry in his head in order to keep his mind functioning, in order to, to stay sane. Um, and then when he finally was released in 1980, we sponsored him to come to the United States. It's a, it was a process that took four years while my mother was um, in South Vietnam as well, or in Vietnam. Um, he came to the United States the first 10 days in San Francisco. My father sat down and wrote out all these poems that he composed in his head um, for many years in prison that he'd kept in his head because he was afraid if he'd ever uttered a word of it in Vietnam, he'd be put back in prison. And it was very difficult for me at that time to try and read this poetry. I wasn't prepared to deal with his years of prison, but he was very calm and quiet and, and um, as di disciplined as I always remembered him. And um, in 1991, was it that um, he was able to publish these poems, both in Vietnamese and some translated versions, which is um, it's a book that uh, was published by a group in San Diego. So he's going to read from that tonight, and I'll read the English versions of it. Um, let's get started with that. Yeah. <coughs> oh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to express my sincere thanks to Mr. Paul Signori, director of the uh, volunteer services, for giving me the opportunity to present my poetry to such a distinguished audience. This is a collection of poems composed during my years of captivities in North Vietnam. 
It recalls the long march from Way to Hanoi along the Ho Chi Minh Trail and the daily life of a prisoner in solitary cell. It also reflects the efforts to overcome the a complete isolation and to survive. To give you uh, an idea of what is a Vietnamese poem, I will read uh, one of the short pieces of the collection and I will ask Dick to read the English translation. This book has been published, as Dick has mentioned, in 1991 in San Diego with the English translation by some Vietnamese scholar. The title is Tinh Tòa. In English, it is sitting still. Chân gắn nền gạch dày, không nghe quả đất quay. Hai năm ngồi một chỗ, đêm đêm trăng vơi đầy. Sao trùng không quên nở, trên dàn chấn sông gầy. Ngàn năm yên một chỗ, không vướng áng mây bay. Ta ngồi trong đau khổ, yên tĩnh giữa trăng sao. Đại dương nào bão tố, không chuyển đỉnh non cao. Ta ngồi trong trần tục, hồn lọc ánh trăng thanh. Bụi hồng gieo cửa ngục, không lấm áo lam xanh. Ta ngồi trong băng giá, đốt mãi lửa lòng son. Thịt xương dù hoa đá, như cô phụ bồng con. Ngóng chồng không trở lại, muôn thuở đợi đầu non. This poem has been composed in Thái Nguyên, North Vietnam, in 1970. Thank you very much. Um, there are two English versions of this. Uh, one is called Sitting Still, the other one is called Quietude. It's, uh, the Sitting Still is by uh, Professor Hun Chan Tom of Yale University. The English adaptation called Quietude is by um, a man named Phong An from Texas, which um, I prefer the one by called Quietude, so I'll read that. As my crossed legs freeze to the thick stone floor, I no longer feel the spinning earth. I have sat motionless for two years in one spot, night after night watching the moon wax and wane, and constellations faithfully bloom every evening beyond the trellis of thin bars on the jail window, an indelible image of stillness undisturbed even by the drifting clouds. In pain and sorrow I sit here, placid amidst the moon and stars. No ocean storms or hurricane can disturb the high hilltop I am on. I sit in this temporal world while moonlight purifies my soul. The terrestrial pink dust that settles outside the prison gate does not stain my gray prisoner's shirt. I sit here while my cold, numb heart continually kindles its fire of faithfulness. Even though my flesh and bones might turn into stone, like that rock resembling the fabled mother holding her son to watch for the return of her forever gone husband, frozen in her eternal weight atop the mountain. Here is the, uh, the other poem composed during the long march uh, from way to Hanoi. It was composed when I crossed the uh, 17th border, the 17th parallel, uh, that is the border between the two parts of Vietnam. <coughs> Nửa bước lưu đày, tàn đêm ngừng bước dặm dài. Bóng tre gieo nặng hai vai rã rời Gió ru thôn ngủ ven đồi Tiếng bom đã tắt bên trời tịch liêu Chuối nghiêng sánh ngã rào siêu Rụt rè lửa đóm tiêu điều mái tranh Võng treo rũ áo viễn hành Nghe đau thương dậy chiến trinh hai miền 
lắng tai khách chủ hàn huyên tóc tang kết chuỗi ưu phiền nối dây trị thiên em ngã non tây hai anh xương gửi rừng cây bắc lào đợi chờ nhạt nắng thưa sao ánh trăng bến hải nao nao đôi bờ người đi ngô lúa ngẩn ngơ xót thân chinh phụ thẫn thờ khép môi vì ai sông rẽ lứa đôi bom rơi bên ấy lệ rơi bên này niềm tây võng lắc vơi đầy tiếng gà nửa bước lưu đầy tái tê This is halfway into exile. When we stop before dawn in our long march northbound, the bamboo trees' faint shadows bore heavily on my tired shoulders. The murmuring breeze lulled the hillside hamlet to sleep. After the air raid, the night was strangely quiet. Nothing was left standing, banana trees, cassava plants, hedges. We finally came to a battered thatch hut where a small torch flickered. I hung my hammock and shook the dust off my travel-worn shirt. I realized the real sufferings caused by the war between the two parts, lending an appreciative ear to our, our landlady's story. Morning followed morning, misery succeeded misery. My younger brother was killed in the Chitian Western Mountains, and the upper Laos jungle is holding my two older brother's remains. Each day I wait for my beloved until daylight fades and stars die out. But moonlight over Benhai River keeps my anguish alive. Even the rice and corn wither for my departed husband and silently lament the fate of the warrior's fallen wife. Who is the cause of our separation, of bombing, bombing over the, there and anxiety over here? On a swimming hammock, engrossed in my thoughts, my heart was heavy when a roaster's crow heralded the midpoint of my march into exile. How are you doing? Yeah. <coughs> <coughs> this is the other poem composed in North Vietnam in 1973. Giá đau thương Sáu năm mòn sông sắt Đợi một ngày sang sông Núi cao chiều sớm tắt Đời quạnh gió tàn đông Tựa lưng vào vách đá, hơi lạnh rã khớp xương Tựa lưng vào đau thương, đời buốt hơn băng giá ngẩng đầu đo mõm đá, ước lượng giá đau thương Cho những ngày chưa tới, xá chi bước đoạn trường Bến Hải ơi, sáu năm mòn vách núi, suối đợi ngày ra khơi Relative sufferings for six years past, I have waited behind the prison's iron bars for the day when I return across the river. The setting sun disappears too quickly beyond the high mountain, leaving my lonely existence to the dreary blast of an eternal winter. Resting my back against the stone wall, I feel chilled to the bone. Looking at my misery in the face, I find life freezingly cold. Gazing through the jail opening at the mountain rock to size it up. I try to estimate the extent of my suffering in days to come and judge my present misfortune still negligible. Oh, Bain Ha'ish River, I have spent these six years fidgeting on the mountain slope, like a brook struggling to flow toward the open sea. The Bain Ha'ish River is the, the river that divided North and South Vietnam for, for the war years. Um, yeah. Uh, this is the other one composed in Hanoi in 1969. Cùng chung chiến tuyến Đêm về đổ bóng đau thương Sân lắng sầu reo khóm nhãn Hàng hiên lộng đón gió sương Vàng vọt đèn treo hiu hắt Bốn mươi phòng hẹp dày song sắt Não nuột ai buông tiếng thở dài Nhóm chúng ta chim mười phương gặp cơn bão tố Tha hương lạc cánh xa Bóng lẽ hồn đơn Ngỡ ngàng chăn chiếu Đợi chờ chim sớm gà trưa 
Không gian quá thiếu Thời gian quá thừa Chân vướng buồn hai thước Một bước đi lên Một bước ngừng Lòng vướng dặm ngàn non nước Nhớ tự do Như hổ nhớ rừng Ngày tháng đã đành không vội vã Nghẽn dòng lịch sử cũng ngừng trôi Hòa đàm chưa vỡ tường băng giá Chiến cuộc còn cao ngọn lửa sôi Xa cách tất gang Gạch dày ảm đạm Tiếng động khẽ đưa sang Cũng vang niềm giao cảm Cùng một dòng sông Cùng chung chiến tuyến Cùng một tấm lòng Bị nhiêu sao xuyến Đắm chìm đêm tối màn tre Khao khát tự do sứ mạng Hoa thắm tình thương Lòng người diễm lệ Đất ngát muôn hương Nghe dồn về từ mấy đại dương Sóng chiến đấu trong tim thế hệ Lá rộn ràng chờ gió viễn phương Thuyền chính nghĩa căng buồm vượt bệ Rào rực hồn rôi thịt chuyển mình Trăng đêm tù chói nắng bình minh This happens to be my favorite poems of his. Um, it's a, Vietnamese is a monosyllabic uh, language, and, and it's, it's very difficult to translate from Vietnamese and, and to get the richness of the sound as well as the words into English. <coughs> um, but that's no excuse for me. Um, on a common front, one of the ways for my father, he doesn't want to talk about this very much, but uh, one of the ways for him to survive in prison when he was being constantly interrogated by um, his captors was to compose poetry that showed a certain kind of defiance and to go through the, the sessions with the captors without telling the secrets of the South. Um, I hope that uh, you can get that from my reading of uh, On a Common Front. Nightfall with its shadows exacerbates my plight and sets down my sorrow under the long and trees. Wind and rain swirl under the eaves where a hurricane lamp swings and spreads its jaundiced light. Somewhere in the forty tiny cells behind heavy bars, someone heaves a sigh of distress. This group of inmates, helpless birds from all around, battered by a tempest, are cast here, away from home, with broken wings. Each night, watching my own shadow, I feel solitude deep in my soul, and I hate the strangeness of my bed. Each morning, I wait for the bird's early song and first cock's crow, and remember I have got too much time to spend in too little space. Footsteps are confined in a two-meter cell in which I make one step forward and stop after the next. I imagine the vast expanses of my country and long for my freedom, like a tiger for his jungle. Not only days and months cease to elapse, history also stops in its tracks. The peace talks have not broken the icy barrier and the intense heat of the war has not subsided. We are only a few inches apart, separated by the thickness of a tarnished brick wall. Through the wall of a faint noise can resound with communion, because we flow in the same stream, stand on the same front line, hold the same beliefs, and are motivated by the same aspirations. In the shadow of the bamboo curtain, I crave for the fatherland's liberty, the sweetness of love, the gentle nature of the people, the multiple sense of the land. I can feel from distant oceans the waves of struggle in the hearts of an entire generation. As tree leaves await a breeze from afar to rustle, our cause will sail on a sweeping wind across the sea. Vivaciously, my soul tickles and my heart throbs, viewing the moonlight in the prison as a dawning ray of hope. You can ask him how he held his hope up during this time in prison. I, I can't begin to understand it nor to try and answer it. I'll take a seat while I go through my version of the story. <coughs> and uh, I'll bring him back up if you'd like to. <coughs> Well, my father was taken away in 1968, and it, it began to teach me a lesson that, you know, 
life is a strange thing where one day your parents are just going to disappear on you. And uh, I was nine years old when I was captured, um, taken away. My mother tried to give us as normal a life as possible in the, uh, under the circumstances. So we went to school. I was nine years old. I, I played the games of a, a, a schoolboy during the day. But at night, uh, we'd go back to having nightmares. We'd go back to waiting for the rockets to arrive at night uh, and to wake us up. The war intensified. We didn't hear from my father for many, many years. We never lost faith either. We couldn't believe that he would be killed or that he had died. So we kept the hope up and, and um, we went to a town in central Vietnam to live where he, he'd been assigned to work there uh, as a civil deputy governor of the region. Um, as the war intensified, um, we, can, we get to 1975 uh, when central Vietnam was slowly being, being overtaken by communist forces um, from the north and my mother ended up sending me to, to southern Vietnam to stay with uncles. She was going to come with me the next day. She was a principal of a high school that had been taken over to be used as a refugee camp of people coming from the north. Um, she got stuck behind. With um, So I left Da Nang and went to Saigon with a sister who was mentally ill. And from Saigon, a month later, in April 30th of 1975, 19 years ago, my uncles in Saigon, my aunts, took me out of Vietnam. We went to a little island off the coast of South Vietnam, and from there sailed to the island of Guam, and uh, then went on to the United States. I want to read you of that time in, in April, since it's uh, 19th anniversary here. This is in that, that camp we went to to wait for, for uh, the American ships to take us away. We were fearing a bloodbath. It was an incredible fear in, in South Vietnam. After 1968, when my father was captured, 3,000 people had been buried alive by the communist soldiers. And so when we were in Saigon in 1975, we were truly afraid of a bloodbath and of that kind of condition. So we all ran away. For the next few mornings, we sat outside the entrance to our barracks to wait for news of the American ships that were to take us away. Each afternoon, we lined up to receive a few litters of drinking and cooking water. At all hours, officials from the crumbling Saigon government and others connected with the American forces in Vietnam arrived on trucks that shuttled between the airport and the camp. All feared a Viet Cong bloodbath. Performers from a CIA-sponsored anti-communist radio station were ensconced in the barracks next to ours. At night, Vietnam's well-known traditional fiddler Lu Lieng played sorrowful tunes. That music is enough to rot the inside of my stomach. I complained late one night when my uncle found me sitting outdoors on the steps to the barracks. When helicopters began landing in the cleared area behind the camp, we knew our departure was near. That evening, tribal soldiers hired by the Americans took us down to the docks. Small boats would take us to a ship moored in the bay. The soldiers ordered us to leave our luggage behind, assuring us that the bags we would be brought to our boats. Later, they told us that refugees from a nearby holding camp had stormed our compound and stolen our belongings. I lost all my clothes, my books, and the photographs of my parents, sisters, and grandparents. I still had a handbag, a discarded mil military container designed for mines, which contained a toothbrush and some underwear. Crouched in the darkness, we waited on the beach. The tribal soldiers exchanged gunfire with Republican sailors trying to board the American ships. It was near midnight when the soldiers took us on a cargo ship, the Pioneer Challenger. Standing, sitting, squatting, lying curled up against each other, people covered every inch of space on the steel deck. They looked like worms. My relatives and I were dazed. We stared at each other in silence, suddenly aware that we'd been on the losing side, and now were deserting our homeland and our ancestors. Images of my mother and sister swirled in my head. My chest and stomach burned with shame. It was April 30th, 1975, the day Viet Cong tanks rolled to victory in the center of Saigon. The war had ended. My life in exile began on the dark blue waters of the South China Sea. For hours, a flotilla of small boats brought more people out to the ship, each fighting the wind and waves to climb the iron steps that swung precariously down its side. High up on the ship's deck, I couldn't hear the shouts of the men below as they struggled to tie their boats to the larger vessel or the cries of mothers as they passed infants and small children up the ladder. 
Dozens of people fell overboard, helicopters circled overhead, taking turns landing on platforms extending from the side of the ship. More hordes of refugees emerged from each helicopter before it was pushed off the deck, an ugly mass of empty smoking still sinking slowly into the ocean. Squeezed on a pioneer challenger, I sat frightened and utterly alone. No one in my family had thought it necessary to talk to me about the plan to leave our country. I had obeyed my uncle and was now accompanying him as a refugee. All I had were the clothes on my back. My father was in prison in the north. My mother stuck in Danang. Yu Quin, I left in Saigon, deep in the seclusion of her ailing mind. As it was, my mother made her way to Saigon um, in the end. She lost her job. As, um, she went to Saigon first to look for, for myself and for my sister, Yu Quin, and um, returned to her job later, but she lost it because she, she'd abandoned her job, basically, and um, because of her connections to the former government, because of my father and all that, she was, uh, the job was taken away. So she ended in Saigon and um, uh, began to sell noodles on the streets of Saigon after 1975 in order to survive. Um, by this time, we'd heard once from my father after the peace treaty was signed in, in Paris, and uh, we knew that he was in prison in the north, and, and that was 1973. But by 75, I left the country not knowing where my father was, whether he was alive or not. Um, <clears throat> I left with my, my uncles, who didn't want to take responsibility for my sister, who was mentally ill, so we left her in Saigon with an aunt. And I came to America, and the first place I came to was uh, Fort Smith, Arkansas. <laughs> I guess I don't have to say much more. Huh? I first set foot in America on a May afternoon in 1975 in the middle of flat miles of rain-blurred green fields around Fort Smith, Arkansas. America's image has changed for me in the years since my first steps on its soil. I've enjoyed New York City, both as some excitement and its picture postcard, wintry beauty after a snowfall, and the idyllic golden hills of Northern California that rolled toward the wine-grown valleys. I have lived many years among the faultless architecture and steep, windswept streets of San Francisco, but I have never had reason to go back to Fort Smith, Arkansas. <laughs> At times, I have thought of the soft green fields I saw that afternoon as though they had been a part of me all my life, and sometimes, for brief moments, I have missed them the way a person misses his home, his memory of it filtered and made attractive by time away. In that May afternoon, the light rain over the fields, the expanse of space, the softness of time, all of these things soothed me. For the first time since my chaotic departure from Da Nang, then Saigon, Phu Quoc, and the ocean journey and the days of harsh sunshine and exhaustion in Guam, I felt a sense of comfort it might have been just another ordinary May afternoon in Fort Smith, but it embraced me in the fragrance of something I had not known until then in my life. It was peace. Yeah, it was peace, but I didn't know that after a week in Fort Smith, Arkansas, I was taken to, to Fort Chaffee for a week, and um, then ended up in Ohio. I had a brother who had been um, sent to Ohio to go to school in uh, 1966, so I went to join him in a little town in um, Ohio called Sylvania. Um, obviously, I didn't take well to Sylvania, and I want to read you a little bit about living in, in uh, Sylvania. The search for peace, safety, and freedom justified my departure from Vietnam, and I found them all in the United States. The voice of reason nagged at my conscience, reminding me to be grateful that I had survived the war and that I had found the door to America open. But like a scorned lover, I could not believe any future happiness was possible. On the streets of Sylvania, Ohio, I kept looking for heads of black hair. American coffee disappointed me. The oranges were bitter. The people had no style or sophistication. Life was bland. Mow as close to that tree as you can, and then when you get over to this side, keep going back and forth in straight lines, my brother didn't explain, flinging his arm out to accentuate his words. I was being initiated in the suburban ritual of mowing the lawn. It had turned hot in June. I pushed the mower around languidly, sweating in the afternoon humidity. Every two weeks, I would pull the mower out of the garage and strive again to get as close as possible to the tree, to cut perfectly straight swaths across the yard. At those times, I hated the heat and the lawnmower and the sound of the two girls next door splashing about in their swimming pool. 
I hated my self-pity and my tears, which were mixed with sweat. I began eating great quantities of ice cream every afternoon, as if the pleasure I got from its milky substance could take away my frustration and sorrow. I hated feeling guilty about leaving my parents and sister behind in Vietnam. I hated not being able to find a job and not having any friends to talk to or things I could relate to. I hated being dependent on my brother for food, money, rides, everything. I did not like the tidiness and the hyper-efficient ways that made life in America so artificial. I hated Ohio. The smell of fresh-cut grass even now brings back to me the memory of the heat of a Midwestern summer and the sadness of life in exile. From my brother's front lawn, I could see the other houses up and down the street. Nowhere in sight was there anything but cars in various colors and houses in shades of blue and gray. No one ever walked on the prim sidewalks. And there were lawns, neat, clean lawns, big and small, rectangular or square, flat or graded, weed free sears, brochure lawns, simple, imperious or ornamented. Sylvania was lawn country. And for me, the lawns began to stand for all that was sterile and uniform and conformist in America. There's some Vietnamese in the room to, uh, today. Did you eat a lot of ice cream when you first came to, to America? Yeah. See, that's why you're thinner than I am. <laughs> um, so after three months in Sylvania and in, in Ohio, outside of Toledo, I decided I would look for something more sophisticated. So um, when a friend came to visit me, um, and so, you know, can you take me to Canada? I have some friends up there, and he told me that there are cafes in Montreal, and you could go hang out with people and talk to people and stuff. So he took me up to, to Windsor, and we went to Detroit, and I got scared, um, frightened for the first time in my life, really frightened. Um, and then I didn't have the, the right immigration papers, so I couldn't cross the border. But there was no going back to Ohio now. Um, so I went to Virginia. I went to Washington, D.C. Um, I went to Virginia, ended up working in a... Roy Rogers restaurant, um, where I had to wear a, a cowboy hat, uh, um, and and I, you know, had the you know the the cowboy shirts with the red checkered stuff and the jeans and the cowboy boots, <coughs> and I would greet the customers as they came in with my accented English, "Howdy, partner, may I help you?" You know. But um, I, I went through a year of high school in Virginia, and it was a rather posh neighborhood for people who were high-ranking officers in, in the Army and working at the Pentagon. And my uncle was there because his wife had worked for the American um, in Vietnam. But while I was going to school there, I had this one little incident I want to read for you. I missed a formal dance midway through the school year. When the next dance took place, I agreed to go. Wearing my uncle's dark brown three-piece suit and my platform shoes, I left the house feeling sophisticated. Marie Lundy was waiting for me over at the school. But as I approached the building, lightning struck. Everyone else was wearing Western outfits. I shot back to my uncle's. Somehow I had failed to notice, and no one else had mentioned, that it was a square dance. Marie waited patiently while I changed. I was hopeless on the dance floor, jumping and kicking completely out of step, and unable to hook arms in the right way or follow the dance leader's calls. We abandoned the dance, and Marie took me to a pizza hut. It was really classy in Virginia to go to a pizza hut. Sitting in her red blouse, short white skirt, and white boots, and ignoring the stares we got, she soothed my embarrassment with her big eyes and managed the kindest smile. I wish I could find out where her address is. I could send her the book, but... <laughs> This time in Virginia was also odd. It reminded me of the time in Vietnam where you go through the daily life and, and listening to, to the rock and roll radio station there, WPGC, and um, in the afternoon go down to, to hang out with classmates um, at 7-Eleven. And then at night drive around in cars like Mustangs, things like that, and go down to the um, donut place. What is that called? Krispy Kramer's? And there was a Vietnamese woman there who, um, every time I came in, she give me this whole box of donuts. Go, 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 run, 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 take it. And uh, so I got overweight again, you know, ice cream to donut. <laughs> but it was a weird time because I'd do that and then go home and have nightmares about my mother and my father. I would have nightmares about visiting her in a hospital, going from floor to floor to floor to floor, not finding her, or if I'd find her, she'd be on a stretcher, being taken away in a helicopter. And I'd wake up and go back to school and, and it was just odd to be in Virginia. And 
Then I got a job after I got fired from Roy Rogers. I started selling paint for, for a place called Sherwin Williams. We cover the world. And then I went on commission. I was selling paint and went on commission. And this man walked in and said, I want some cream paint. And I said, well, what do you want to paint? How much do you want? He said, well, I want to paint Fort Belvoir. And it's a huge fort. It's like painting the Presidio here. So I made commission on that and went out and bought my first car, a VW, and paid cash with it and all that. But that wasn't enough to, to pay for school, so I ended up in California. Um, I came out here and lived in San Diego for a while and began to work with, with Vietnamese people uh, as a social worker and then slowly moved to, to um, I moved up to San Jose. I don't want to admit this, but I lived there for a year. Uh, <laughs> I go back there and I, I feel really strange. And then I moved to San Francisco. And while in San Francisco, I got a job, so um, I became an American citizen because the job was in, in Indonesia, and I'll read you that part about becoming an American citizen. I decided in one short moment to get U.S. citizenship. Until then, the thought of formally becoming an American had always pained me. I had filled out a few applications since 1980, the year I became eligible, but I always discarded them. I would simply be disloyal. I had come to dislike America for what had been done to the Vietnamese and to Vietnam during the war. Even as I lived in its cities and among its people, I remained alienated from American culture. The most powerful force preventing me from submitting the application was the feeling that acquiring American citizenship would forever sever my link to Vietnam. I took comfort in the fact that I was applying for citizenship, only to return to Asia to live among my own people. Yet shame clung to me like a heavy summer shadow. I succeeded in having the application process speeded up, and within three weeks I was summoned to the Immigration and Naturalization Service in San Francisco. I waited two hours. The woman who met me for the citizenship test smiled gently, her white blouse, blue blazer, and redneck bow making her look the part of a civil servant. She wanted to start the test right away. Panic set in with her first question. Did I know who designed the American flag? Calvin Klein, I ventured. He designed everything else in America, hadn't he? And who takes over if the President of the United States should be unable to fulfill his duties? Alexander Haig, I said. The lady laughed and moved on to ask what the requirements were to be a presidential candidate. I had studied that in political science class seven years before in Virginia. Well, I said, uh, you must be uh, U.S. born. Well, that's good. Anything else? Mm, you can't be mentally ill. <laughs> the woman opened her mouth, her eyes bulging. I wondered whether she would ask me about football, hamburgers, Chevrolets. I survived a few more questions before she said, ah, uh, get out of here. You're really funny, you know that? By the way, she added, Congratulations. At the courtroom ceremony a week later, I stood among 300 other soon-to-be Americans. The judge managed to move me with a well-rehearsed speech about the American tradition of accepting immigrants and about the democratic principles of the founding fathers. Next to me stood a toupee Filipino in a sky blue blazer over patterned bell-bottom golf pants, an American flag in his hand, another pinned to his lapel. He repeated the judge's lines word for word during the swearing-in ceremony, loudly pledging allegiance to his new country. He then turned to me with a big smile and perhaps because he noticed the dampness in my eyes, extended his arms to hug me. I patted his shoulder and turned away. How was I to explain to the jubilant man that my tears had not been tears of joy at becoming an American? How could I tell him that they had come when the judge talked about bearing arms for the United States? I did not want to explain the images of American Marines pointing rifles at Vietnamese villages in black pajamas. Thank you. <clears throat> so I, I ended up um, leaving for a year, went to Indonesia and came back here. And uh, I came back from, from Indonesia because my parents were allowed to come to the United States at that point. And uh, I found I, I was reunified with my parents in 1984. It was a strange time to be living with them. I was 25 years old at this time, and I had last seen my father when I was nine. And we had to readjust to each other, and it was difficult and sweet and wonderful. And the first week, he spent time writing poetry, and I was worrying about how to support them. The second week, he put on a suit and went down to Holiday Plaza, down at Powell's Station, and found himself a job. Um, 
to him, 12 years of prison, all these years of war didn't really matter. Now there's a new country. And they've taken on to this country very well. My mother started working for um, a program to help women with infants and just only retired last year at the age of 70. Meanwhile, I'll, I left this country again and went to, to work in, in uh, Europe and then finally came back here. And my parents are starting to accept me again now. <laughs> um, if you have questions for either of us, I'll bring my father back up here. So, please join us. Algie? I have a lot of questions, but I'd like to start by just asking if you can explain a bit about your family's politics. Because, uh, you know, I, I, I get the feeling that they were very connected with the, the Saigon government, and I, I'd like some explanation of exactly how deeply they were. Um, thanks. Well, my father can tell you about our, our, our family politics. I mean, I look at it this way, maybe he'll tell me that I'm wrong, which he often have to. But uh, definitely we were anti-communists. We were working for the, uh, he was working for the, the South Vietnamese government. Though I, I would point something out, when, during the time that we're talking about from the, the 70s on, or the late 60s, South Vietnam was ruled by, by military men, by the army of South Vietnam. My father had nothing to do with them, didn't care for them, didn't care for that style of government. But because of his patriotic feelings, he worked for the government and, and became a civilian and refused to join the army and, and went to school to, to be able to sustain himself as a civilian and worked in the government. He um, earned a degree in public administration from Michigan State University and from the, the Public Administration Institute in Vietnam as well and uh, worked that way. Um, that brings up the question of me wanting to go back to Vietnam to live now. Um, because I, I look at it in a culture context. That is home for me, that's where I grew up, that's where the values are that I appreciate, that's where there's a kind of lifestyle that I appreciate. But my father differs with me, so it's, it's still a, a socialist country ruled by, by paranoid men, and he doesn't think I should go back there and live, and it's dangerous. Um, but I like Vietnam, there's a sense of urgency there. You don't have the kind of, of problems that you have in this country, you have other problems that are more immediate and you need to worry about it, like putting food on the table every night. And that kind of urgency drives you to be and behave differently. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to um, hear your father talk a little bit about how he remembered the poetry and how he constructed it and just the whole process of what that was like. <coughs> Writing a poem in a, a cell in North Vietnam is not to have a desk, a pen, and a piece of paper. We cannot write out and write out. This is a poem whose spirit is against the policy of the North Vietnam. So I don't have any paper. I don't have any pencil. I don't have any desk. So. I have to think over the subject to choose the words and to, to try to have the music of the verb. And I try to do it mentally and I have to memorize it. I think, I think this is a very good question because when my memoir was published, some critic asked me almost the same question. They asked me how you can remember this detail after almost uh, 15 years. I think the main reason is because I was in very special situation. You are in a, a cell living lonely, years after years, and you have to think. You cannot stop thinking. So we have to think over and over the same problem. So you cannot forget it. So I remember this detail when I was writing my memoir. And it's much easier to remember this thing 
and to fix this thing by some verse, a poem, or short. And so it's much easier to remember the, the poem and to memorize and to keep it in, in your head. And the first time I came to San Francisco in 1984, the first thing I have to do is to sit down at the desk and to write out this poem. Thank you. Are there more questions? Yeah, um, I have a question. Did you write poems before you were captured by the communists? And how did you refine your poem writing skill when you were in prison? Actually, I like a poem. And I have written some poem when I was uh, almost 18 years old. So I have to practice writing poem when I was very young. It's not suddenly that I start to write a poem when I was in a prison. Thank you. There was one in the back. Yeah. Who made the arrangements for you to leave the country? For me or for him? For you. Um, my uncle, as, as I said, his wife worked for the Americans and we got um, put on the list um, to, to leave the country uh, by the Americans that were about 100,000 people left at that time in 1975. On the south. So. Do uh, these poems follow traditional Vietnamese patterns, uh, you know, of classical Vietnamese literature, or are they sort of in a modern English American idiom? Um, oh, this is a very good question. Um, we have uh, in Vietnam what we call the ancient poem written according to some very definite rules. But after the, we get in touch with the Western civilization, we have to adapt some modern rule. And so I used to write the poem according to the ancient way, but I do have some poem written according to the Western style. So is it can, we combine, I combine the new and the old one. Side. In the back. Actually, my name is Tony. Um, actually, I have a question Hi. for you, Doug. Um, I was wondering how did you, you know, giving history, stuff like that, the people who came here in the U.S. between the period of 75 and 80, mm -hmm. I was reading the article <coughs> about the, the thing that you wrote. My question to you is how do you see yourself as, you know, I mean, you've been here long enough and I would say maybe probably me too. So we were kind of lucky enough to adapt, understand the culture now better than the people who came after us. My question, I guess, is how do you see yourself different than your uh, so-called older generation, like your sibling, your brother, your older brother? And what do you think of what is, the next question is what is the most challenging thing you see as a generation like us facing here in America? That's a good uh, dissertation question for a PhD person. <laughs> but it is a question that I ask myself constantly, Tony, um, and I suppose other Vietnamese do too. Um, yes, I've been here for a long time, for 19 years now, and, and I came at a young age so that I could adapt easily to, to American life, go to Krispy Kramer's and listen to rock and roll song and, and all of that sort of thing. At the same time, I see myself as sort of a bridge between that older generation and that younger generation. Um, and so if you ask me what, how I feel about what difference there are, my father can tell you he, he's very different from the way he lives than I live. He lives within the Vietnamese community. He goes to book readings in Vietnamese, he watches Vietnamese videotapes, he has Vietnamese friends. I have some. I do some of that. At the same time, I, I write in English and I have American friends, Western friends, English friends, 
and I learn other things as well. And so that difference is that I have the chance, opportunities I've been educated over here as well, so that I can do those things. Um, and yet I know within me, sometimes I can't intellectually uh, recognize it, but I know that I have certain Vietnamese values, certain Vietnamese traditions. My wife, who's English, is always baffled by that, because as I function daily in a Western setting, I'm very Westernized. And then when I'm home by myself with her, I will react in certain ways. She goes, you're being very Vietnamese, um, indirect and sometimes patient or overly patient. And so I see myself as a, as a bridge with that younger generation as well, where I have something that I took with me when I was 17, when I left the country, um, 16. The younger generation now intellectually know about Vietnam, they've read books about Vietnam, about their homeland, and they care and are curious about Vietnam, but they don't have the kind of, uh, this is generalization, but that kind of deep emotional thing that I have, that I want to go home, I want to live like the Vietnamese in Vietnam, and I believe deeply that I can do that, uh, I think they have more doubts than, than I do. Did I answer your question? Or? Yeah. Did you have a uh, question? Yeah, what, uh, what writers do the both of you admire and perhaps emulate? Right ahead. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, first of all, I like Hemingway. <laughs> I used to read uh, the French author, and I like Antigit. I like François Mauriac. I like Romain Roland. I like Paul Valéry just to mention some of them. Um, when, I, when I was nine years old, when my father was captured, um, I inherited the library. I decided to move into his library. Um, so I had his library. So I grew up reading Verlaine and Baudelaire and books about Richard Nixon and Mao Zedong. Um, in America, I think I've, I've there are particular people I, I want to mention. There are the people who I'd like to be able to, you know, in certain books that I wish I could have written, um, Rin Malin from South Africa, his memoirs of exile and of, of being back in Africa is a, a terribly, uh, how do you describe it? It's, it's a wonderful book. Um, V.S. Knight Paul is a good writer to me. Um, I like him. Paul Theroux as well. He's a very good observer of things. Other questions? I thought somebody else might ask you this, but uh, since they haven't, um, I, I would love to know how you managed to keep uh, hope in your heart while you were in your little cell for so long. Yeah. Um, it's hard of hearing and I'm trying to mumble to him. <laughs> I think this is one of the crucial question. How to, first of all, how to overcome the complete isolation and how to survive. I think the only way we can survive in such a condition is to hope. And I think I was in the right way. So I win, succeed. So I hope, even in some, in some dark days of the, there is a time in, in captivity, I keep to maintain the hope in my heart. I express it in some of my poems. And I think when the poems were published, some of the, uh, reader write to me and tell me that you give me hope because in this condition you can hope. So now we can hope now. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you very much.